Have you ever wondered what it's like to be the son of one of the most famous rappers on earth? To my older listeners out there, Outkast will be someone you easily recognize with hit songs like Hey Ya. Rolling Stone named them as one of the biggest and most influential rap groups of all time. So today, we talk to Bamboo Patton, son of Big Boy. Let's dive in. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have a very special guest. We're here in the hills in Atlanta talking to Mr. Bamboo Patton, real estate investor, wholesaler, subject to guy, which we'll explain what that means as things go on. But also, you lived a very interesting life as the son of a famous rapper. Who is your dad? My father is a big boy from Outkast, um, legendary group, rap group out of uh, Atlanta. They recently, I think, just got voted as the number one band, group, duo uh, for Rolling Stones. It's pretty big shit. Yeah, that's pretty big shit. And so for the younger people that might not know about their reach, like these were the ultimate rapper rock stars of their era. And they're still selling out shows, right? They're still yeah. going around the country and doing big stuff. So I guess one thing I'm very curious about was there pressure growing up in a hyper successful family where like you, you have a dad that has achieved arguably whatever is possible to achieve. He's kind of done it. Did you go grow up in a house with pressure or was it very relaxed and laid back? Like, what was that like? Man, I mean, definitely immense pressure. Um, however, growing up, I was in a two parent household. Um, I live with my mom, uh, but we stayed like five minutes around the corner from my dad. Um, so did your parents separate when you were young? Yeah. Okay, and what did your mother do? My mom does hair. Um, she's uh, some type of medical assistant as well. Okay. She's really like a jack of all trades. Like, and and how old were you when your parents separated? I don't think I was even one. Damn, they didn't hold that long, yeah, huh? No, no. It, it was a bit of a love triangle, actually. With another woman or man in there? Yeah. No, 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 another woman. Damn, that sounds nice. That sounds interesting. <laughs> okay. So tell me about the immense pressure. The pressure, man. Oh, man. Just, you know, my dad being who he was. Growing up, being able to, to well, learning how to navigate the space of, like, that, that sense of discernment. Like, oh, like, oh, these are my friends. Oh, these aren't my friends. Oh, they want something from me. They don't want something from me. It, it was a bit of a... Internal, ongoing internal war. Always. How young were you when you felt like people were potentially using you to get to your dad? Oh, bro, from the jump. From that, like a baby boy? From, from a baby boy. Like maybe starting like when I first started school. So school friends, like they'd want to become friends with you just to come over just so they could say they've been into the <laughs> right, house. Right, which is nuts, right? It's crazy. amazing that a five-year-old would even care about <laughs> like crazy. who's a big rapper. Right. And... Right. Give the people just a little bit of color for the people that aren't f familiar with Outkast or what your dad did, like how big they were and what type of things he he did in his career. Man, Outkast, I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with the song Hey Ya. Uh, Jump uh, around. <laughs> um, Miss Jackson, the whole world bombs over Baghdad. Sorry, Miss Jackson. Uh, I am for real. Na, 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 na. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Yeah, bro. It's honestly, bro. I cannot name one bad song, non-biasedly, of course. Like their their sound was so ahead of its time and so different from everything that was coming out of the South. They kind of were very much experimental, but still just like very creative, and it was like great music. And was this a situation like were you going to get? groceries with your dad or like could you go do normal public things with your dad or was everything like oh we have that delivered to the house no Every, everything i mean we would have you know people go run errands for my dad but whatever my dad could include us in um he would make sure that we were there with him all the time whether we were going on the road with him or going to the aquarium or anything we were doing normal people stuff as well um but it was always like oh big boy can we get a picture can we get a picture oh big boy please like you know, Even with his kids around. Bro, every, anytime. You Do you know. find that strange about people that they, like, getting a picture is such a priority that they're willing to disrupt somebody's entire day and time with their family? 
I mean, not really, because like it's two different worlds. Um, just imagine like if if Michael Jackson, like if if you see Michael Jackson with his kids, you're not gonna see the kids. You're gonna see Michael Jackson and be like, oh my gosh, like. That's Michael Jackson. I have to say something. I have to get some type of interaction with Michael Jackson. You know what I mean? I feel like I would feel bad. Just I would be. I would like be wanting to say something, but I would just feel too like like I'd be a bother to do anything about it. I mean, there were definitely people like they would of course interject and be like, uh, "I'm sorry, I don't want to bother you. I know you're spending time with your kids, but it's always the but." You know, it always is the but. It's huh? always the but. Because then they rationalize and say, "But yeah. it's just gonna take five seconds, exactly. or." And that was from the jump when you came out of the womb. Like, what did that do to you as a child? Like, what did that make you think about the world? Bro, I mean, even to this day, I'm, I wouldn't consider myself a paranoid person, but I'm very much, I, I, I always have my guard up for sure, you know? Like, I'm a very nice guy. I'm going to treat you with love always. You know, it's nothing but love always, but I'm always like, it's going to take time. Time will tell, like, reveal the the essence of your true character with me at least. I don't know if this is getting into too much detail, but I'm curious, like when you're at that high level of notoriety, like do you have to have security at your house? Do you have to have like a sentry or like people patrolling the perimeters <laughs> with like, you know, German shepherds? Like what was what was that like to keep your family safe? I mean, for, we had like multiple levels of security from dogs um, to there was security with us as well. Um, gates, you know. Um, it, it wasn't like a, oh, like a free fall, like anybody can just like walk up or anyone can just like, you know, stroll in or, you know. Did that make you feel safe or did it feel like it was intruding on your life to have all those extra people around you? Honestly, I didn't really pay attention to it at, at a young age. I was just like, oh, this is so-and-so. Like, oh, they're, they're cool. They're awesome. Did you become friends with any of the security guards? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then they would take you around town to go do stuff as well? Yeah. Ah, because I guess to a really sick person, like, you would be a target too. Like, you know, if we if we kidnap Bamboo, <laughs> man, it's, it's crazy. You would have to start thinking about what yeah. could go wrong in those situations. Yeah. But my dad made sure we were straight always. Like, it, it was never any of that. Never had an instance of that kind of thing. Well, to my understanding, to my knowledge, No. If you can go through your memory bank, is there a particularly strange or uh, kind of weird story that you encountered because of this life that you grew up in? Hmm. Off the top of my head. A time that just felt intrusive or maybe alarming or scary? Uh, I mean, it's just like if you go out in public, it's like nothing but eyes. Always eyes on you or always eyes on the people that you're with, like always. Like it's like, dang, like you wanna have a staring contest? Like <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, bro. <laughs> like <laughs> there's a there's an interesting dynamic that I think a lot of people really want to be famous, but a lot of people that have been famous say just get rich and see if you still need the fame because having the money to do what you want is really cool, but mm. fame can have a lot of downsides. From your angle, what are the downsides of fame? Uh, I'd definitely say privacy. Privacy pressure to continue to... Privacy or pressure to... My bad. Let me start over. Mm -hmm. Permission to be human. Uh, like you're almost supposed to be this like trophy kid or like right. tip, always in tip-top form. and right. Okay. Did you notice anything? Like would it be teachers would treat you differently or like, hey, I can't give this kid an F because I don't want his dad to be upset with me kind of a thing. Thankfully, no. Uh -huh. Thankfully, no. I, that would have felt like cheating. You know, I like to work for what I, whatever I earn. I like to work for it. I don't like handouts. Um, yeah, no, I like to be treated just as equal as anyone else, any other person. So I'd imagine your, your parents would have to have a considerable amount of foresight in order to prepare you correctly for life. Because I think like being the son of a very successful or wealthy person could be a curse for a lot of people. Like I just saw, we, we saw in the news recently, 50 Cent's son was complaining. I don't know if it, he was getting like nine grand a month, or, <laughs> but he was like trying to publicly humiliate his dad for only giving him nine or 10 grand a month. 
but he didn't real. He was so out of touch with reality that he thought that was a reasonable thing to complain about. And then there's these people that can't even pay rent that are like, dude, you're getting ten grand a month from your dad. Like, so he ended up getting roasted and, and taken through the water. And I think that's a relationship that I, I don't know his relationship with his son, but it seems like it would be. It's going to need some repair. What did they do to put you guys in a good position so that when you go out into the world that you were going to be fine? Honestly, bro, I don't know if they even had a handbook, pretty much. I mean, my dad was, what, 18, 17, 18 when he, like, when they, like, blew up. You know what I'm saying? So he's growing up just as we're growing up with him. We grew up mm. with him. You know what I mean? So it's, like, every step of the way and kind of just, like, watching the way that they move. And thankfully, like, my dad had a head on his shoulders to, and he's very, like, very like particular the way he does things. He's very careful. He's not like a reckless person at all. And he knows the way the world works, you know, cause he didn't come from like money or any of that. So being able to like instill that in us, not even by telling us, but just by showing us was like enough. Do you think it was a blessing in some ways that your parents did separate? Cause you almost got like the tale of two cities where like, yeah. well, tell us about that. What was that like? Definitely. Like, with my mom, like it wasn't like always like oh going places or uh, unlimited spending or you know what I'm saying or like high end fancy things or whatever. Um, like with my mom, it was like more so like strict parenting. My mom's Korean and black, um, so I got like that's the, a dynamic duo bro, of a mother, bro. That's that's strictness to a T. It's crazy, but I'm so grateful for it. Yeah, because I'm I'm who I am today because of the way that she raised me as well. Isn't that interesting when we're growing up? Cause I had a very strict household. My mom in particular was pretty strict, but looking back, I'm extremely thankful for it. But when I was growing up and like, I always thought my mom was like, mom, you're crazy. Your mom, you're <laughs> like, but I think strict parents really do help you in the long run. Absolutely. I agree. Like both my mom and my dad did not play. They did not tolerate BS at all. Like, and that I'm so grateful for that. You know, so and now on the positive side of of the story, like what's something you got to experience, or like, oh yeah, like uh, um, Johnny Depp walked into the house and did X Y Z. Like, what's like a funny or interesting story that you got to observe because of how you grew up? Bro, I never forget. There, were, I think we were. Uh, it was Madden Bowl. It was either in Houston or Louisiana, and we, were, my dad was there. I guess he was performing or whatever. But we were backstage, like in one of the dressing rooms, and then. All of a sudden, like Michael Vick and like Chad Johnson walking Oof. in, I'm just like, what the? And I was like a football fanatic. I mean, I still kind of am, but like they walk in and they're like, nephew, like, what's up, man? I'm like, what? Are you serious? Like, that's is insane. Like, it's crazy. I was thinking about Michael Vick the other day because I remember he was by far my favorite player to, I would always play with the Falcons and <laughs> always like run outside the pocket and have so many options because of his speed. The whole, how long did he, did he serve for dog fighting? Was it a couple years, three years? That's a great question. And it was, yeah. from what I remember, it was during the prime of his career oh, too. Yeah. yeah. I guess... I'm trying to figure out if that was fair or that was kind of crazy that he, uh, like a man of his stature got put in prison for three years when you have people doing like the bankers in the 2008 crisis, like people that have taken billions of dollars, like don't even serve a day. But a guy that was at the highest potential of his earning career went to prison. <sighs> I was trying to think about that one. And like yes. there's, it would be hard to be a judge or uh, to make laws in this country to, to, to assign people time for prison, I feel like is a really tough task because two murders might have two completely different stories. Like if you're avenging, someone takes out your wife and you kill that. I don't know if you get a year, like I don't think you get 20 years for that. But then if you just like break into someone's house and brutally kill the whole family, of course you get a long time. Hmm. Do you feel like this country is a fair place do you, you feel like, uh, do you feel disenfranchised or do you feel like uh, I'm proud to be an American? Because I think the youth in this country are kind of going through an identity crisis in a way. Mm. I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm proud to be American. Um, I'm grateful to be an American for sure. Mm. The, the, the amount of opportunities, endless. The access to clean water, endless. Um, 
food, all of that. Not not having to worry about that thing, those type of things. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like not having to worry about going to get water down the street in the river or anything like that, or, or of that sort. You know what I'm saying? Or anything, any extreme circumstance. It's not like that here. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Do you feel? Uh, but in your generation, like. I don't I don't know if it's leaving the country like a sense of patriotism but like I don't mm-hmm. feel like amongst pe- we're only a few years apart but like even in the Gen Z uh generation like how many kids are really like proud to be Americans and not that they like I get why they wouldn't be in some ways too but do you feel like for the most part kids your age are not they're not gung ho or patriotic anymore Definitely it's definitely fleeting for sure How do you think we get that back cuz I think Obviously, a country can go too far with patriotism. Like that's how like Germany in World War II got out of control. With like they thought they were so cool and so great that they can take over the whole world. But I don't think like not liking the country is a good option right. either. How do you think America wins its people back a little bit more? Mm. That is a very deep question. Yeah, that's a one we could probably ponder for a few hours. Eh? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I would say there has to be more cross collaboration between people of all different kinds of backgrounds, all different kinds of classes. There have there have to be resources and spaces provided to to force those type of conversations, to force the collaboration, to reteach people how to communicate properly. So almost like that we're so divided that we need input that forces people that maybe wouldn't ordinarily agree to get in the same room together literally that that, i feel like that's the start and then you have to teach people reteach people how to be okay with disagreeing with one another and still being able to hold respect for one another somehow some way that is a big one because you should be able to be in a room and not like someone's opinion and still be able to like you like we're sitting in the room with Abraham Gray, a mutual friend. And like, there's a lot of stuff he says. I'm like, you're a maniac, dude, but I still <laughs> like the guy. And it doesn't mean I'm not going to talk to him because I have a difference of opinion. We have lost that. And it's almost like you have to be, it does feel like it's more thin ice. And I, I feel like it's more so when I speak to folks that are like way farther left on the spectrum, I feel like I can't say anything wrong. Like when I inter- you introduce yourself to them, like, I'm not going to say what's up, man, because I don't know if like that's how you are. Like, I don't want to accidentally say the wrong thing. Do you feel that at all? Definitely. I mean, I, I was going to school in New York at one point. Uh, 2018, I graduated from Woodward Academy in College Park. Um, was like, I'm ready to go far away from Georgia. Went to New York City. Was going to uh, the new school, which is like an art school right in Manhattan. Oh, you were a fancy man, huh? (laughs) Making (laughs) art and toasting cocktail glasses, huh? (laughs) Not even, bro. But I was, I I was ready for something different. Like I I was craving a different type of culture, and little did I know what I was really in store for. Like I got exposed to all of that. Like, oh, you you appear to be a woman, but you go by they. That that's different. But to each their own. Right. What did you learn? Because especially in an art college, you're going to have more of a um, probably heavily diverse and heavily left on the political spectrum. What did you learn from your experience at an art college like that? I mean, I learned first and foremost, even though I don't come from that type of upbringing or that type of culture, to be able to coexist with someone like that, even if I may not agree with it or disagree with it, even though I'm personally not moved by it at all, like, I'm all about love. So, like, I respect you as a person. If that's what you identify as, then hey, so be it. Were you ever disliked off the bat simply because you came from a successful family? Yes. What was that like? Because you didn't have anything, like, you just were a kid and you just grew up. Like, what was that like being, and what is that that people dislike success? And I guess more than just success is the money that comes with it. But what is that, do you think? I don't know if it's a dislike. I would say it's more so envy mm. and jealousy a little bit. And, and it's nothing that I can even control. You know, it's like, what? Like, I'm, I'm not even like, you, you don't even know me. And you don't like me or like you, you envy me for what? Or not for what, but. What type of assumptions do people make about you because you came from money? 
well, one of the biggest ones maybe that like I'm a spoiled brat, maybe. Mm-hmm. Or like I'm I'm just like they have this depiction of like, oh, he comes from money, so he doesn't know how to interact with people that don't come from money or he he thinks that he's better than everyone else when in reality that I've I've never even that thought has never ever crossed my mind ever because mm. that's not me, you know. Was almost everyone at that art college at least somewhat well off because I'm guessing the cost of tuition was pretty damn considerable? Majority of them, yes. Loaded. Because I've noticed like some of the people that like are the most of like eat the rich and like rich people are evil, like they actually come from like upper middle class <laughs> backgrounds. Did you notice that? <laughs> yeah. It's so weird yeah. to me to see. Yeah. It's It's almost as if they have to, they feel the pressure of conforming to public the public opinion of what what everyone else is in favor of in order to be liked almost you see what i'm saying and it's almost like overcompensating over too. exactly exactly it's weird it's kind of weird hmm. it's kind of weird so because like you said when you when you grew up with your dad that it was almost like there's unlimited possibilities with with what you could spend how is that figured into a career that you've chosen and how is that um you've come up with the how, how have you decided like what is enough for me like right because i feel like it would almost be if your starting point is like oh anything i can get or anything that i live in this nice house i have this nice car and then you become on your own like how do you figure that out well i'll, I'll go back and correct that a little bit it wasn't more so unlimited spending but it would i could tell the difference for sure you know right. what i'm saying it, it, the the bar was definitely a little bit higher um but my dad still wanted to make sure that wanted to make sure that we know that it's not like oh just because you asked for it, you're not going to get it like you do have to work for it as right. well um but back to your question i would say i'm i'm more so like a people person in terms of like i'm not really okay if the people around me are not okay so mm-hmm. i feel like getting into real estate and getting into these business ventures and networking with these high level people is not just for me mm-hmm. at this point. Like I want to be able to actually make a difference and actually change people's lives on like in like for like endless amounts of time for like forever. So some people hear real estate, it's a pretty broad term. What aspect of real estate are you involved with? Currently I'm managed two Airbnbs. And then I have a long-term rental as well. Um, I've been managing the Airbnbs for two years. How is that going? That seems like it would be... Some people, I've heard it's a gold mine, and then other people, it's a nightmare. Or it's, it's very lucrative. I guess it depends on the team that you have. And thankfully, I was paired with a, a co-host who kind of taught me the ropes at first. And then as I got into it, I would kind of like pick up on things that she wouldn't even have to teach me or... Um, and then as I got into like real estate more and doing more research, I got to meet different people that were also doing every Airbnb, but at higher levels. And they would also teach me things. And then I would bring it back to the co-host and be like, hey, let's try implementing this with this property. And it worked like crazy. So it's very lucrative. Did your partner, is she the, the type of person that has super host status? Yeah, we both do. <laughs> oh, okay. We're dealing with the super host. Okay. So... <laughs> yeah. What have you learned about the Airbnb game that makes someone successful? And what have you seen that can really sink people? Mm. Definitely price automation. Uh, like letting AI in Airbnb set the price? Yeah. Okay. Like, don't try to do it yourself. Like definitely implement that system. It will calculate it based on comps in the area or how Airbnbs are performing nearby and do it for you. It's literally a lifesaver. Um, How long have you been involved with Airbnb? About two years. Okay, because I know I was looking at different reports because my sister, um, her husband's in the Navy and they're looking, they they can use the Navy loans to buy properties. And they were looking like, hey, should we buy a, a property? And then once we move to our next duty station, should we make it into an Airbnb? And a lot of places have gotten really saturated with Airbnbs. And because of that, the occupancy rates have dropped significantly. How have you avoided that? in because you have your stuff in atlanta i'm guessing yeah how have you avoided that um hmm. i mean definitely it goes down to comes down to price price and your amenities which you're offering um 
as far as like um, discounts as well. Is there anything unique that you would say you and your team do to attract people to your Airbnbs? Oh, well, we started an Instagram page mm-hmm. called Big B&Bs, um, and we're constantly pumping out content, uh, exhibiting different highlights of the properties or like uh, memories that were had in the properties or like experiences guests are having in the properties. Um, and we're just like constantly posting. Is there anything you do to make the Airbnb an experience and not just a place you stay for a night? Definitely. In both of the Airbnbs, there are stripper poles. Oh, whoa. If you get down like that. So do you have a lot of like bachelorette parties come and get your spots? Surprisingly, no. We've had a couple though. Okay. Dude, what is with Airbnb? Because we were just talking about this. We I almost never go to hotels. And last night we got a hotel and I'm like, oh, 100 bucks for a room for two bedrooms like or two beds. That's pretty reasonable. Like Airbnb, like they're trying to like charge you a $400 cleaning fee and you have to do the cleaning. It's like, what the <laughs> hell is going on? Like what is happening in Airbnb right now? Yeah, it seems to be a little bit of a meltdown, uh, especially for people that are not very much experienced or have the proper teams or systems in place, it's, it's going to be a bit of a hellish experience right now, for sure. Okay, so where do you want your investing journey to go, or where do you see yourself branching off to? Without a doubt, development. Yeah? Development, for sure. Okay, and are you thinking in a place like Atlanta, or are you thinking in a city that's more in the early stages of growth? Mm, definitely. I mean, it would be cool. For both, honestly, because Mm -hmm. you already have the existing needs of a place like Atlanta and then like catering to those needs. And then for the early uh, a city that's not so uh, populated or like is on the rise, um, you're creating the needs and feeling, you know, based on other cities or based on, you know, the community, I guess, Hmm. if that makes any sense. So going back to... um The second part of the question, and this is something we were just talking about in the car. I was talking to a a YouTube friend that uh, is just trying to figure out his next chapter. And the question is, what is enough? And because I know like you can just accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. And pretty soon it's like, what am I even doing this for? Like, how do you, and then I think it's also like uh, bouncing off your childhood too. Like, how do you figure out what's enough in your adult life? Another fantastic question. Um, personally speaking, I would say enough for me would be to where my passive investments or passive income, um, is, um, funding my life, my daily spending, uh, any bills, rent, um, school for my son, um, any endeavors, any trips for me, but not just that, but also for those around me as well. And then teaching them the way to do it and then them going to teach others how to do it so is it hard to get your friends excited about investing your real estate no they're jumping in yeah that's exciting i feel like why is that kind of stuff not taught more in school like entrepreneurship real estate how to leverage money it just seems like i don't know if it's on purpose that it's missing from the school system or just an oversight and it hasn't been corrected in so many decades but why is it you think that these things are not talked about to kids when they're coming up in the world? Because it's all a game. In order for people to win, people have to lose. And so, so you think it's like a zero-sum game where not everyone can win. There has to be losers. There has to be winners. Yeah, but it's strategic, st- strategically designed that way, unfortunately. Okay. So now maybe what we can get into is like the system or like... Uh, because in the in the music industry, I was talking to you about this a little bit before. Like they talk about like Illuminati and all these like things lurking in the shadows. Do you think it's really as bad as the rumors might say, or is there any more color you can paint on this picture about what things are in the music industry? Mm. I mean, a lot of things I feel like are hidden in plain sight if you're hip to that kind of stuff um but if you're not then the veil would kind of still be over your eyes or or you're choosing to be okay there's like let's say a common one like uh like a a tiktok conspiracy theorist might say like 
if you look at a music video of Little Nas X or different people that are using devilish symbols, right. is this on purpose trying to communicate something darker behind the scenes like subliminal messaging? Or is it just edgy marketing because they know people are going to click if they make it seem on the edge? I think it could be a mixture of both, without a doubt. Do you think the people running the music business are evil? Some of them are. Like there's evil intentions lurking in the music business. 1,000%. Okay. Can you tell? That's a very confident answer. (laughs) What makes you say some of that stuff? You don't have to say details or names or... but like. Why do you why are you so confident that there is evil lurking there? Hmm. <sighs> You're trying to get me hurt. <laughs> is it that it, serious out there? I mean, it, 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 <laughs> is it that crazy that like you have to be scared to like talk I about? I mean, it? I'm not scared, but or you have to be cautious. Like you have to be aware to talk about it. Definitely. Wow. Definitely. Because I, it's, I don't know, when I was more in my, uh, like, growing up in high school, started getting into the reefer, you know what I mean? And conspiracy theories were a constant thing that we would talk about. 9-11 and the Illuminati and why wars have happened. But some of these things you think are worth considering and, and worth looking into more. Definitely. Okay. But I will say once you start... It would be almost impossible to to not be aware or not have your eyes open to some of the stuff that's actually going on, you know. Okay. And if this is too far, let me know. We can move on to another <laughs> subject. But like like I've seen words like artists like uh, I think it was the baby. Like they make them wear a diaper, they make them wear a dress, like there's humiliation rituals that they put these artists through to show that they're controlling them. Is that like a purposely done thing or is that a publicity stunt? Like, hey, I'm crazy. I'm wearing a diaper. I think it's also a bit of both. It can be a bit of both. In that situation, uh, I can't really speak to that situation. I'm not sure on that one in particular. But but, but in like overall, I guess, is it just that people with money? Because I guess with the, okay, maybe we'll make a different transition. With Jeffrey Epstein, he had enough money that he could buy any legal of age hooker he ever wanted and do whatever. But at some level of money and power, it's about the game of getting people to do things that you're kind of not supposed to. So like sleeping with minors or getting other people to unknowingly sleep with minors and then tell them afterwards. So do you think it's like part of it is when you get to that high level of stuff, it's just the power game. That's what it is. That's what these little humiliation rituals are. It's I've made so much money. I don't care about the money, but I want the power. I think so. It just, I don't know, maybe I'm naive about the world or I just haven't met enough like really wicked people, but it's it's almost hard to believe that it's that evil out there. I mean, do you know where America makes a lot of its money from? I'm sure there's war. Okay. Prison. Okay. Uh... Can you enlighten me a little bit more? Sex trafficking. That our government or just people in general make a lot of money doing that? Ultimately, all of them are on the same team. Oh. That's another thing that doesn't even feel real, but I know that the numbers are like higher than they've ever been. The numbers should be zero regardless, in my opinion. I mean, not in my opinion, but but I think they should be zero. But, okay, because I think... uh, Okay, so the Sound of Freedom came out, and they made it kind of feel like it was supposed to be suppressed, like major uh, movie studios wouldn't produce it, so they had to do it kind of independent. Do you think that this is something that they don't want people to know about? I mean, it's kind of inevitable. I mean, I think a lot of people are aware of what's really going on, and then you have TikTok. That's like the real news. You got people talking about everything from all sides, all points of views. You know, you get like so much undisclosed information and un, un, what's the word? They're, so because the, and also because the Chinese might be influencing the algorithm, they're they don't care to filter away the propaganda that we might receive. So that's why TikTok might be a threat to the establishment is because it's they're not able to control the narrative as much. Absolutely. 
I mean, it's out there, bro. And whatever you want to know, you could definitely find out. I guess this is the thing when I when I when I dive deeper into those things. Sometimes I feel like the videos explaining it is like some guy in his fourth blunt that's like, <laughs> dude, the Illuminati, dude, it's real. Like, what the what's the crazy documentary? Uh, Zeitgeist. Have you ever seen Zeitgeist before? Have you ever heard of that? I've heard of it. The first like thirty minutes. So it's this documentary that basically exposes all of the secrets of the world and nine eleven and the the Federal Reserve and all these different things. And like the first twenty minutes is like hypnotizing you. Like there's so many like flashes and bangs. It's almost like it's like trying to get into your mind before they tell you the truth. Like I I haven't really seen it be discussed in a way like when we're talking about Illuminati in the music world. I haven't seen it be discussed in a way that doesn't feel like some guy that's a few blunts in, like, kind of saying, trust me, bro. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, that, that's very valid. That's very valid. Like I said, you're going to get points of views from high guys, drunk guys, people that are tripping mushrooms, people that are tripping acid, people that might have been in the, like, might have experienced it, or people that are just speculating or people that are just just don't believe it at all. Maybe I'll try another way to look at this. Is there a lot of non-disclosure agreements that people have to sign in the music business? Yes. So the the artists that are no longer still on top, like let's say a guy that had a big blow up moment but not talked about anymore, the reason he doesn't come out and talk about what's really happening is because legally he would get in big trouble if he tried. Do you think there's some of that going on? Yeah. But then you have people like Orlando Brown, who's all. I mean, I mean, he's kind of like that's a that's a polarizing example because I I don't know if I'm familiar with Orlando Brown. You should definitely look him up. Who who's Orlando Brown? He used to be like this big time Disney star. He was like, uh, what was the show? That's so Raven. He was a uh, uh, Raven's friend in the show. Okay, and he came out and talked about the. He, he talks about everything like no filter. But then people would be like, oh, he's on drugs. He might be on drugs. <laughs> but, but he's still telling you what he thinks is his real experience. Yeah. But it's just like confirming what other people are saying as well, which is, you know. Well, I'll ask for specifics, but can you say like, I'm sure that there's some high profile musicians and artists that you've come across and you come into your house and you get to listen in on conversations. Is this something that's discussed in those circles? Like, man, this industry is so messed up kind of a thing. And that it's evil or the the control, the power, the things that people put each other through. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to push too hard on this because I feel <laughs> like you're in a position where you <laughs> want to say something, but you can't. So I'll leave it with this. Um, what can you tell people that are chasing a path, chasing a dream? What kind of advice can you give to people that are checking this episode out? Stay consistent. Um, it's not what you know, but who you know. Um, and as long as it's bigger than yourself, it, it's going to be bigger than what you even imagined it to be. It, so that that set the second piece you said, it's not what you know, it's who you know, which is commonly said, but it's kind of a disturbing thing if you really think about it. Because like it doesn't always lead to the most talented person winning, but it's the most connected person winning. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, for example, like you got people that are like putting all this time in to go to school just to get out of school and go work at McDonald's versus you got people who are not in school at all, might be 19, 20 years old, just happen to be in the right place at the right time, end up making millions of dollars. It's, it's crazy, you know? Hmm. It's insane. That's just like a basic example, but... Well, folks, I think in the future, I'm going to have to figure out how to, get, how to bring you guys more of this uh, music industry information, but I don't know enough to, to say anything. So um, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Check, is there a link, your Instagram or whatever you have uh, in, the, um, in the description, and you guys will see you next episode. Peace. Peace.